prayer, then we'll just get into our study. Very good. Give me a few seconds here to get rolling. We're almost there. And we are there. Very good. Good morning, everybody. It is Friday, May 15th, 2020, and I'm joined with uh, my good friend, John Kilgore, out of Houston area, Texas. I'm not sure exactly what town you live in. What town do you live in, John? Houston. I live in Houston, right on the border with Sugarland, Texas. Good. Very good. And Houston is almost as big as Los Angeles, where I grew up. But I want to just make you at home here, John, and put that on. There you go. Is that backwards or is that, how do you see that? No, I see it. I see a dry creek camp behind it, Florida College. You saw your monk uniform that, or costume that you wore. It's what shows you've gone, you've gone. There you are, you're back. One of many. So on my image, it's backwards, but if you see it, okay, I want people to see that. Very good. Yeah, it's not, doesn't look backwards for, to me. Perfect. Very good. Well, just one of many costumes I'd have fun with that you tolerated. It allowed me to get away with. I always Halloween. thought that would be funny. <laughs> Very good. So let me uh, start us off with a word of prayer. We're going to be in Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, what's called the similitudes. So people joining in, we're going to get your Bibles out and look at that. Uh, I'm going to start us off with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our study. So let me pray. Let, let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, it's good that we can be together, John and I, and we're thankful for the, the audience here that people can tune in. We're thankful for the miracle of the internet that allows us to come together in times like this, and the use of technology that is often misused and misapplied, but we pray that we're using these things that you've given us for good. We pray for wisdom as we look into your word today. Our hearts are mindful still of this virus that presents the situation that we find ourselves in. Please be with those that are on the front lines. Be with those in the service industry still working feverishly to help our lives be a little better. And be with us now as we try to do your will. It's in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, John. Like last time, a few weeks ago, we looked at the Beatitudes and did a great job with that. And mm -hmm. You just set this up where I am the student and you are the teacher. So I like this. Teach me. John. Good. We're good. good. Let's just do a couple of baldies. Not too bright on the screen, I hope. And let's just get at it. So thank you, John. And I, again, I'll be looking at comments uh, written in Zoom and written on Facebook. And I'll just interject those when I see fit. Very good. Where should I start, John? Reading the passage, or what do you want to do? Now, let me make a few introductory kind of set the view from the kind of a high level view of uh, the correlation between the Beatitudes and what we're going to talk about today. Now, the Beatitudes, you recall, there are eight of them. And basically, they are describing the character of a Christian or as the wording of the text, it's kingdom, kingdom people. People are in the kingdom who are under the rule of Jesus Christ, who are submitting to the rule of Jesus Christ as their king. You know, it's a certain kind of person. And relatively speaking, they're the minority. Well, even they're actually, and not even relatively. Actually, they always have been and always will be a minority of people who will submit to Jesus as their king and obey him. And so the Beatitudes have described a kingdom person, humble, poor in spirit, one who mourns for their sins, one who is controlled or who is under control, and those who are righteous, seeking righteousness. And they're, therefore, they are, uh, are merciful and they have a pure heart and they're a peacemaker. And for this attributes or these attributes that go together to make this kingdom person, the world persecutes them. That's the reaction of the world towards such a person. So the purpose of our lesson today is what is the role or the purpose of a Christian or in case of our context, this person, this wonderful person, 
that the Beatitudes describe? What role does God want them to play in the world? What effect should we have upon the world? Or spoken another way, what is my purpose? What is your purpose, Jeff? Those that are listening, what is our purpose? God ordained purpose in the world. Well, let's read. Let's see what our purpose is. Let's read now, Jeff, 5, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Here we go. Matthew 5, verse 13, beginning. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. All right, the purpose of a Christian, according to Christ, is twofold. First, we are to be the salt of the earth. And then secondly, we are to be the light of the world. And I don't believe that the order is just happenstance. This is a purposeful order. You have to be salt before you can be light. So keep that in mind as we discover and see what both are representing. First of all, let's talk about salt. Now, let's think, Jeff, for a moment about the historical uses of salt. How has salt been used in the past? Mainly as a preservative. This is before. All right. Preparation. Very good. So there's one, a preservative. Can you think of another use? Not really. <laughs> All right. Good answer. Well, what about a flavoring? Okay. Yes. Salt flavors everything. I mean, we recognize that more today, possibly, than any other time. You know, salt used to be scarce. And I read a book one time on the hist history of salt. If this author explained how the world developed in civilization based upon whether or not a civilization had access to abundant salt, salt was absolutely essential. For the functioning of the world. I never, so, salt my, I never salt my food. That's why you stumped me on that one. But all right. But there's salt already in your food. Exactly. Exactly. You know, <laughs> and without additional salt, and I rarely uh, add salt to mine as well. But you started out correctly there as a preservative, you know, to preserve food and to preserve health. You know, have you ever heard the expression to pour salt in the wound? Mm -hmm. Well, it, what, what do they mean? Well, you're hurting me more. You know, you're making it worse. You're making it more painful to pour salt in the wound. Well, that comes from an actual uh, historical situation. You did that in order to uh, put an antiseptic into a cut. Salt was used to help cuts heal. And also, of course, you'd want to have salt in your diet. And not only to preserve life, but also as a flavor. But then let's think of the historical value of salt. The uses were as a preservative and as a flavor. But look at the historical value. It's interesting to know that Roman soldiers were paid in salt interesting to me is the breakdown of the word salt it comes from sal the latin s-a-l sal well that's salt have you ever heard the expression a person is not worth their salt right it was really they're not worth the salary we're paying them mm -hmm. because roman soldiers were paid in salt it was necessary to if they got a cut in battle or whatever they would pour it on the wound Mm -hmm. and they would add it to their food. But also uh, in the Bible, the Old Testament, salt is used as a metaphor for, note this, fidelity and constancy. Note these. I'll just quickly quote these passages. 
Leviticus 2, 13, Jews were required to put salt in their grain offering. Quote, it was called the salt of the covenant of your God, the salt of your covenant to your God. Numbers 18 and 19, speaking of the portion to be given to Levites by covenant, quote, it is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord. Interesting use of the, of the term salt. He wasn't speaking literally of salt. Salt was being used to indicate this covenant God is being constant with you. He's showing his fidelity, and we respond with fidelity and constancy by observing his law. And then finally, 2 Chronicles 13, 5. Speaking of God's promise to the house of David to have the rule over Israel, God said, do you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the rule over Israel forever to David and his sons by covenant of salt? I apologize for the ringing of phone. I'm not going to answer it, but uh, it's going to ring. You're a popular guy. Okay. Well, it seems like in inopportune times, but <laughs> any rate, yes. But so salt historically has stood for constancy and fidelity. So, but I want to make this observation. Where is salt effective? Not in the shaker, not in the box. Salt has to contact other things in order to function. And that's important for us. Say that once again, because I think we're- All right, let me, let me put it this way. Salt only finds the fulfillment of its purpose by contacting other elements. Very good. I mean, you can have a lot, you have salt all over your house, but if you don't put it in your food, it doesn't work. If you don't put it on the wound, it won't cure the, the cut. You've got to put it on something. So keep that in mind as we make application. So what's the implications of the statement for us? What are the implications of you? And, I, and let's emphasize this. In the Greek, this little pronoun you is the emphatic you. It means you and you alone. Isn't that interesting? Jesus told a group of fishermen and relatively, you know, um, not the intelligentsia of Israel, certainly not the leaders, you and you alone are the salt of the earth. So what are the implications? Think of one, Jeff. What are the implications of that? Well, when you made the comment about salt, we have to come in contact. We have to get in contact with others. There's All right. Very monk, good. There's a picture Wait. of a monk behind me, and that's just for joking circumstances. But reality, monks were known for hiding on top of hills and secluding themselves. And But in a general sense, Christians are very good today at just surrounding themselves only with other Christians and in that social circle. And how can you blame us? We love each other. Let's hang around each other. But we have to challenge each other to get out and be an influence on the world as well and interact with others. Yeah. Why don't we apply what we've seen in this present uh, pandemic? <clears throat> We're all being told to distance ourselves socially. Well, folks, there's a danger in distin distin distancing yourself spiritually from the world. You know, this was a misinterpretation of purity to say, well, the way we are going to be pure is we're going to cut ourselves off from the world and we're not going to be so we won't be contaminated. No, if you're going to be salt and fulfill its purpose of salt, you're going to have to contact the things that need preserving and need flavoring. Well, let's think about it. What needs preserving or who needs preserving? <clears throat> well, we do for one. That's another aspect I would apply. Right. You talk in the context of a local assembly, 
And that's one thing I'm hoping and praying for. I saw this after Hurricane Katrina. I don't know if I shared with this you before or not, uh -huh. but we did not meet for a few weeks, but after it was all done and we came back, there was a, a, a spike in attendance. People were appreciative of the fact we can now assemble again. And that's our saltiness, if I use the word, going with each other and that's helping each other. We need that. And when you don't have something like this that removes that, you take it for granted. Now right. it's been removed from us. Now what's going to happen when we get the all clear, if and when that happens, we're going to be hopefully like Katrina. Our attendance was great for a year or two right after because people didn't like that taken away from them. They appreciated the benefits of being salty with each other. I'm going to put it that way. All right. I'm going to build on your idea, but I'm going to turn it just a little bit. Worship is being together with other Christians is preserving or increasing or reactivating what? Our saltiness. Our ability to preserve and be a preserving agent or element, to be a flavoring. Where? In the world. The world is decaying. Why? It doesn't have enough salt. It does, it's, and it's boring. Because there's not flavoring in it. Just look at the, the, the references in scripture. And I'm taking now a very, very high view of history. I'm just going to list three events in history. Well, we know that God created the world perfect. And by six chapters into Genesis, God is repenting that he made the world. He wants to destroy it. Why? It's corrupt. It's dying. It's dead. It needs to be removed. So he cleanses it with a flood. It starts all over with eight people, Noah and his family. Well, by chapter 18, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's already corrupted again. So he destroys two cities very graphically. And then throughout the Old Testament, you see various periods where God acts and destroys sin because why there is a corrupting influence all the time in the world and then by the new testament you have Gen uh, romans chapter 1 verse 21 especially the gentile nation totally bankrupt morally totally corrupt well that's the world that's the world we live in that's why the world persecutes people who are not like it, who are, you know, the salt. So in 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, I'm sorry, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life are not from the Father, but from the world. We need to recognize that. The world we live in is morally bankrupt, and decay. Why? Doesn't have salt in it. Doesn't have the influence of salt. So what is our purpose? To preserve against those things that would harm and destroy God's creation, which is our job. This is why he made us into the people we are, for this purpose. And also, let me add, to flavor it. Now, this is one of the hardest things for us as Christians to accept. It's very easy to think that our world is boring and because all we're doing is sitting around singing hymns and reading a little scripture and praying and looking at one another. No, we have the wrong view. And the, and the whole world is having all this fun and we're left out. It's one of the challenges of working with young people to get them to see what is the real flavored world, world of happiness, true, deep joy, the world of real purpose and usefulness and the joy of knowing who you are and where you came from and where you're going. So there is a flavoring against boredom of life produced by materialistic uh, goals, materialistic uh, lifestyle, and a self-centered philosophy 
that turns us inward. It causes us to not enjoy the world that God made. So, what's the remedy? If to the word, we are. Wow. What a purpose. What a, I mean, you couldn't sign up for a better job than this. You know, spend your life being an influence or being an agent for change to enable other people to come to the real world, the flavored world, the joyful world, and the world that has light. But there's a warning. Let's look at the warning. Read again um, verse 13 and emphasize the warning there. Jeff, just verse 13. Sure. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? Ah, the warning. If you become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? Then what's the warning further? What good are we then? What does it say? No longer good for anything. Ah, worthless. Worthless. No secondary use for salt. No secondary use. You're either going to be salt or you're going to be cast out and become road material. Be walked over, metaphorically speaking, and useless. Who wants to spend their life being useless? And other passages point this out. Peter describes it as, after learning the truth, and turning back to the world, losing our saltiness, we're like a dog that's returned to eat its own vomit and a pig who decides to go water in the, in the mire again. I mean, what a pointless life. Jesus is pointing us to purpose, to usefulness of really using your life in a wonderful way. And again, I think of times of worship and study it's times to renew that saltiness. But remember, worship is not the end. Worship, therefore, rejuvenates us, makes us renew our saltiness to be used out in the world. And when we're out in the world, we then come back into the assembly to be renewed again. See, we think this, John, Go ahead. about salt, and it says there it becomes tasteless. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I've studied correctly. Salt never becomes tasteless. It never loses its flavor, but it can become useless. And I think that's maybe a better word. I've stood at the feet at the Dead Sea where you get to float on top of the water. That's a great, that's right. a great experience. But at the shores of that, you see a lot of salt on the ground that is useless. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's been polluted or corrupted or left there. And it's maybe it's come into contact with the wrong things. And that's what makes it useless. And to me, what a great metaphor for us, right. because our saltiness can become tasteless or useless if we become corrupted by the wrong things, that bad company corrupting the good morals that we are supposed to have. So that's where we have to be careful, isn't it? Yes, yes. Now, it also illustrates the, the principle of how to use metaphors. You have to allow the speaker, in this case, Jesus, to use a metaphor the way he intends to use it. It is true that chemically speaking, salt is always salt. It's a very stable element. But if the point is, you know, as you sing that salt that is on the road around the Dead Sea, they're not scooping that stuff up to put in your food. Right. You know, and I, I, want, to, I want to reference something here that a lot of people misunderstand. And it's 1 John 3, verse 9, which says, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed, the Lord's seed, which is the truth, the word of God, abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, this is not teaching once saved, always saved. This is a teaching the, the doctrine that after becoming a Christian, you can't sin as to be lost. 
You know, that's dealt with in the first chapter of, of first John and into the second chapter as well. But it is teaching that when you quit being salt, how do you keep being salt? You allow the living word of God to dwell within you and, and guide you and teach you and cause you to live a certain way. It's an ongoing active verbs here. No one who is born of God practices sin. In other words, people, when we practice sin, we are denying the effect of our salt. And we can do that. If you do that long enough, you become useless. But if you keep that word active in your heart and in your life, it's called being born of God. You keep on being born of God. And that, therefore, is the goal of every Christian. But isn't it, let's summarize it. Being salt, going from an essential, preserving, flavoring, and the warning is you become road material. You don't want to do that. So, any other comments on salt before we go to light? No, I just... The only observation I have is when we are in our assemblies, when we're singing, when we're paying attention at the Lord's Supper and uh, the prayers and the scripture reading, that says a lot. I mean, that says a lot about how in tune we're, are we bored to be there? Or are we excited to be there? And by the way, visitors will see that as well. There's an evangelistic setting there as well. Are you bored? Just looking at your phone, looking at something else. That makes a difference on visitors in the crowd for one but if we are enthusiastic about that that's the buildup we have that's the the shock that we have to then go into the world and be that salt that he's asking us god is asking us to be be that salt and then be that light we'll get to in just a moment that one helps us do the other yes now we could comment this is just think of this What's one motivation to being with other Christians in worship and activities of the church? We need it. We need our saltiness uh, built up, reaffirmed, regenerated. Who we are. Our, think of the Beatitudes. We need to grow in humility. We need to grow in our recognition of sin, in our act of repenting. We need to grow in our gentleness. We need to grow in our search and find hungering third for righteousness. In worship and study and praise and taking, reminding ourselves of Jesus through the Lord's Supper helps all of that. It helps us. And so we ought to think about times of worship, corporate worship. Well, I need it. You know, I need to be with my brothers and sisters. So let's move now to light. Yes. Jeff, what are the implications of you? And let's be reminded, you and you alone are the light of the world. What are the implications of that statement? There's a lot there. I mean, I'll try to keep it simple and concise, but obviously you cannot see without light. And look today, looking outside, you see the light shining off this nice beacon right here on my head. Yeah. But again, it's a metaphor for the light of the world. This is what's going to give us understanding and perceptiveness and discernment into what's going on in the world. How should we react? How should we respond? That's the way the word of God gives light. It helps give us a direction and a pathway that makes sense, that can bring consolation and contentment. So again, it's a beautiful metaphor. There's a lot of ways we can go with that. All right, one major implication building on your statement is the world is in darkness. Darkness, right. Spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness. Ephesians 6 through 12, speak of the world forces of this darkness. John 3, 19, this is the judgment that the light, Jesus, has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. 
for their deeds were evil. That's why they loved the darkness, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light. It does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. To Jesus' statement, you and you alone are the light of the world, implies that the world without you is dark. It's in darkness. It's in darkness because of sin. And only the man of God is enlightened. Isn't that interesting? Spoken at a time after the great Greek philosophers, you know, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato. Well, where does our world normally think of those who are enlightened? Well, our universities often. Maybe the prestigious ones. Those out on the West Coast here in Texas on the East Coast, etc. These are the enlightened places. Some often think of it that Washington, D.C. is just filled with enlightened people who are directing our government and our affairs. Others will think of the scientific community. These are the ones who are enlightened. And look at the advances that we have made in science, technology. Think of the ones out on the West Coast in Silicon Valley. These are the enlightened ones. Jesus told a bunch of fishermen and other, just as we would say, common people like ourselves. And how will those? Yeah. I'm sorry, oh, yeah. And how will those anointed ones, including professional athletes, Hollywood elites, or a news organization putting a twelve-year-old girl on their panel as an expert? I'll just use that and be careful how I use that. How will those anointed ones? take hearing that it's fishermen and uh, people who've relinquished what's important in this world to go after that light, how are they going to react to that? And that goes back to our previous lesson, Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when you get persecuted. It's going to happen. You're going to get insulted. You're going to get persecuted because they're not going to like this message. They don't want to hear they're wrong. The pride is too, too strong there to say, hey, you're right, John. I hear what you're saying. I'm, that's going to happen. They're going to react the same way Jesus' world reacted to him and to his disciples. Don't be surprised. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Remember, only the man of God, Jesus says, you and you alone are the light of the world. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought of God. That's John 3, 21. Those who have come to the light are the ones who are enlightened and able to reflect, to shed that light into the world. Remember 1 Corinthians 1, 21? The wisdom of God is foolishness to man. Man has always thought that the wisdom of God was foolishness. You know, we can invent atomic energy. The question is, how are we going to use it? And what are you going to do with it? Are you going to help people cure cancer or whatever? Or are you going to blow people up with it? Kill them? In spite of all of our advances, in science and technology and history, whatever field that man devotes himself to, what do we still have? We still have great chasms of purposelessness, identity, personal relationships, broken marriages. We still have it. In some ways, even more so. Isn't that... Go ahead. Just, isn't that the uh, how clever Satan is? You think of Ecclesiastes and it starts and ends with vanity, vanity, all is vanity. But we can get ourselves so busy without spiritual direction. But how many people do we talk to? I'm just so busy. And the question should be, what are you accomplishing? You can be busy going a million directions and accomplish nothing. But that's a question for us as Christians to ask ourselves, what are we busy doing? Yeah, we can have internet, but what are we doing with that? We can have 
Yeah. Uh, Clark, what are we doing with that? We can have resources. Are we being good stewards of what God has given us, I think, is the deeper question. Uh, the Christian knows more about life and its nature, its destiny, than any worldly philosopher. Any. Why? We know the source of life. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then we become light in the world. John 8, 12. He who follows me shall have the light. John 12, 36. Believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Peter 1, 4. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 4. We become partakers. 2 Peter 1, 4. We become partakers of the divine nature. Of course, God is the ultimate source of life. I love the old hymn, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from the lighthouse evermore. But to us, He gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Our light must lead others to the light. Not to ourselves, but to him. So what does light do? Let's expand the metaphor to further understand what our role is in light. Well, light exposes darkness or drives it away. Its goal is to eliminate darkness. Remember the prophecy of Isaiah that Jesus quoted when he began to do his public ministry. This is in before the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 4, 12 through 17. Verse 15 says, the land of Nebula, Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali, that's where um, he was speaking at the time. He was in the region of this Zebulun and Naphtali in Capernaum. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them light dawned. You know what a, <laughs> what a, a wonderful statement, really ostentatious statement in a way. The person walks in and says, I'm the light of the world. It's ridiculous if it's not so. It is so. He demonstrates it being so. Paul, among the Gentiles, Acts 26, 18, to open his role, his preaching, is to open their eyes, principally the Gentile world, that they may turn from darkness to light and from the domain of, uh, of Satan to God. Shed light. It explains also the cause of evil or darkness. What is it? It's sin. It's sin. Sin drives us into darkness. It shows us the way out of darkness, which is to Jesus. Uh, 14 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me, because I am the light of the world. But he also gives a warning. What is it? Give it the warning to us, Jeff. Here, I think it's in verse what? 15 or 16? City 7. Uh, verse 15, nor does anyone light a lamp, put it under a basket. Verse 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they go may... Back, go back and read the verse before. I'm sorry, verse 14. Yeah. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Ah, and further, then verse the next what phrase? Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. Now, why would Jesus make that statement? What, what, what warning is he giving them? 
regardless of the circumstances, you will be noticed, you will be seen. So it's good to not ignore that, but consider that. And I want you to be seen. I want you. I put you on a hill. You don't build a city on a hill if you want to hide it. And I didn't build it in the valley. I didn't build it to be just this clustered over here where nobody knows you and never sees you and never sees what you do and who you are. No, I put you on a hill so that you can be seen. And further, I didn't light you as a lamp in order to put you under a basket. We've got to be careful that we don't take steps that hide by not speaking up, by being silent when we ought to speak, by not being who we are at all times. Oh, what tragedy that is. When we divert our moral lives from who we are and engage in activities that hide that moral character That is the salt of the earth and the light of the world. I'm ashamed of times in my life when I did that. My aim and my object is to never repeat that again. To be who we are all the time. And especially when others, maybe even when when others can see it. So that's where he's placed us. So let your light shine in such a way as to do what? Who do we want to glorify? Jeff, that's your question. Who should get the glory? We're drawing glory to God, not ourselves. Not being selfish, obviously. Let me go back, John, and make an application this way. Sometimes the concern is, what are you speaking out about? These last two months have been crazy. Understatement. Right. So I'll, I'll confess something here. Two or two and a half months ago when I saw the headline that the NBA was canceling their games, I actually put on Facebook, this is crazy. We're going way too far. Within a day or two, I said, I'm going to take that down and eat those words because in our very county, we have started having deaths from this virus. I spoke presumptuous. I spoke too soon. I spoke hastily. But then I've learned from there and just to keep quiet. Now, John, you and I both know people that are passionate on all sides of this. Right. Open up, shut it down, wear a mask, not wear a mask, 10 feet, 10 people in a building, no limit to people. There's all over the board. And I've chosen deliberately to stay out of a lot of those discussions. I make my own personal decisions based on what I think is best for me and my family. But I know some people that are very passionate about one side of this that were talking to me and wonder why I don't speak up more. Why aren't you the light and the, and the salt that we're talking about right here? And my answer is I have to pick and choose my battles here. And the battles I choose to pick are book, chapter, verse. And I'll have an opinion about this, but I'm not going to let that define me. I will try to fit in the society, but nobody's stopping me from doing this Zoom meeting right now. So I'm not being hindered at all. And I feel like I am speaking up, but sometimes, but it's hard to do that I guess the point is it's hard to get the right balance there sometimes, isn't it? When you have people that feel so passionate, Christians we love on both sides of this, all sides of this, and we're trying to carefully walk in the middle or be the reasonable person in the middle, be a cooler head. That's a challenge, isn't it, sometimes? Yeah, it is. And maybe we could, this will help us. Think of that particular action. Does that demonstrate that I'm having the effect of preventing decay, of being salt, of being a flavoring in the world, Mm -hmm. then does that reflect that I'm pointing to Jesus? You know, being cooperative and obeying the suggestions of our authorities in the world that are not a matter of sin or righteousness? Why not? If wearing a mask will help me have influence among people as one who cares about people, whether or not I'm affecting them, whether I believe it or not, does that help me be light? Does that help me to be salt? What helps me with this, John, is a question I always ask myself is, what is my effectiveness? Am I being effective? And then what am I being effective for? 
When you talk about sacrifices, think about Acts 15 and Acts 16. Big discussion on there's not a need to circumcise, but then Acts 16, to accommodate the effectiveness of the spread of the gospel, I'm paraphrasing, get yourself circumcised. Yes. Ouch. But that's how far we need to go to be effective tools for the gospel. That's the sacrifice he's asking us to make. As we begin to draw our lesson to a close then, let's think about our value. Christians, and I believe that probably, I don't know who's listening, who's watching this presentation, but likely the majority, if not all of us, are Christians. Jesus says we are absolutely essential for the health and the salvation of the world. Not us personally, but who we represent and who we speak about and who we direct others to. Very important. We were called for this purpose. Listen, if we're not fulfilling this purpose, does it question whether or not we're really a Christian? You know, remember, you and you alone are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. If not me, then you, then who? Who is God counting on if it's not us? Exactly. Now I believe God. If I don't, if I choose not to fulfill my purpose in the world as a Christian, He'll find someone else who will. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need me. I need Him, and I need Him for a purposeful life. And some people ask, "Well, how does that work? How do we do that?" Well, let me give you an analogy. I'm a lover of classical music. Sorry, I've just kind of been that way even from a young age. I like all kinds of music. But the music that I relate the most to and I find myself going to again and again are the old classics. And one of them was written by Beethoven, a great German composer. It's called Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is a, also not only an orchestral piece, but it's a choral piece, and I've sung the chorus, been in a chorus that sang that several times. I just love it. But I remember the first time I experienced that, I was just so moved and so buoyant in my excitement to share it. And I come to Jeff, who maybe prefers something else, but I'm so bubbling over with passion to share this experience with him. And I say, now, Jeff, I want you to get the experience that I got. I'll sing for you. I'll just hum along the tune. Da, 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 da. And he says, after a while, John, you know, I'm not getting it. <clears throat> then I don't. Well, John, I'll tell you what, Jeff. The symphony is performing that tomorrow night. Just come go with me and I'll let you experience it. Jesus converted Philip, John chapter one, and Philip was so excited, he went to tell his friend, Nathaniel, and ultimately he said, Nathaniel, just come and see. Come and see, come and see. That's how we fulfill our role of being salt in life. When our saltiness causes others to ask, well, who are you? Where did you get this purpose? Well, come and see. Come and see. We'll after close that, with that. After that analogy, John, I'm surprised your ringtone is not Beethoven's Ninth. It's clearly not, since we can hear that. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. I'm more of a Franz Liszt guy myself. We can talk one other day about classical music. I do have enough yeah. affirmation for that. But I think the point is good. And here's what I take from that as well and see if you agree. I, it's interesting to see what the world gets excited about. For us, it's the Portland Trailblazers. It's the Seattle Seahawks or things of that nature. And you have to sit back and ask, am I that excited and enthusiastic for 
what's what I should be passionate about. Mm -hmm. Am I that excited for the Lord? Hey, come and see the Blazer game. They're in the playoffs. Come see this game or whatever. But in reality, I can see what the world gets excited about and ask myself, am I that excited and as passionate about what's important to me? That can be very telling. And then ask the question, why or why not? Correct. When I talk to people about the joy of worship, I ask them, do you really enjoy it? And if not, why not? And if you do, why do you enjoy it? You know, it, you know, the reason people, for instance, we often talk about people not coming to worship. Why don't they? Because they don't enjoy it. If they did, you couldn't keep them away. They'd be there. Why? Because they enjoy it. And being getting that saltiness again, getting that reaffirmation, getting that stirring, getting that looking into the word of God and being moved again to go out and tell somebody, why don't you come and see? No, there's no power in us to convert the world. It's all in Jesus. We've got to ask people, why don't you come and learn about him? And that's all we've got. Well, that's all I've got. That's oh, good enough, John. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I pre And by the way, this leads to, you know, next section, because this tells you to, let your light shine, let your salt go. But in Matthew 6 and verse 1, he starts talking about motives. He talks about beware of practicing your righteousness before men. The concern is just check your motives. Why are you doing it? Exactly. You can do the right thing, but if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, then you're in trouble to be glorified by God or to be get the accolades of men. And that's just a deeper, that's the next major. Well, there's more to this Sermon on the Mount. It's a beautiful sermon. Thank you, John, for taking time Thank out you. and sharing your thoughts for us. My I do love you, my friend and my brother. It's good to see my you pleasure. and spend time with you. I'm going to encourage you to go to Facebook and just check those comments out later on. I'll tag you and everything else, but really well done. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you, John, to say goodbye to Facebook as I log that off. So say goodbye. Goodbye to Facebook and all of you who have been listening. Thank you. And watching. <laughs>